Hello, everybody, and welcome to week eight of 3P, brought to you by a collaboration between the Cure Parkinson's Trust, the World Parkinson Coalition, and the Van Andel Institute. And here with me today, I have Michaela Johnson and Ashivara Kulkarni, who will have their presentations on the theme of olfaction in Parkinson's disease. So first out, we have Michaela Johnson, a postdoc at the Van Andel Institute, and she will present her research on deficits in olfactory sensitivity in a mouse model of Parkinson's disease. And if you have any questions for Mickey during her talk or when the quick Q&A starts, look at the bottom of your screen and please submit your questions. So now over to you, Mickey. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, just turn off my video. Okay, we'll get straight into it. So as many of you listening in will know, people with Parkinson's disease can experience both motor and non-motor symptoms. So motor symptoms include those uh, typical motor symptoms such as resting tremor, bradykinesia, postural instability, and these motor symptoms are useful for the clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. People with Parkinson's disease also experience many non-motor symptoms, and there's quite a few listed here. There's a very wide variety of these symptoms and can affect patients differently. The main one I'll be talking, or the only one I'll be talking about today is olfactory problems. So hyposmia, which is a reduced sense of smell. Greater than 90% of Parkinson's patients develop hyposmia, and this can be quite an early symptom of disease. So it can occur years or even a decade before those typical motor symptoms develop and the patient's diagnosed. So is uh, apparent in even the prodrome or the early stages of Parkinson's disease. Our lab has previously established a prodromal model of Parkinson's disease by injecting alpha-synuclein preformed fibrils or PFFs as they'll be referred to throughout this presentation into the olfactory bulb of mice. And this work was performed predominantly by a previous postdoc in our lab, Nolan Ray. So this is just an example of a heat map showing the phosphorylated serine 129 positive alpha-synuclein pathology, which we used as a marker of a pathological alpha-synuclein to assess its spread from the site of injection in the olfactory bulb to connected brain regions over time. Uh, this heat map on the slide is just showing the results for the one, three, and six month time point. And you can see that as uh, more time goes by, the spread of pathology from that injection site uh, becomes greater throughout the brain. So in this cohort of mice, they were also assessed for odour discrimination, odour retention and odour detection deficits. So I'll just be talking today about odour detection deficits and the results for the test used as that's most relevant to the data I'm going to present later on. So for the odour detection deficits, the test was uh, involved a mouse being placed in a clean cage with a ball containing either mineral oil, which was the diluent, or a diluted odour. There was a 50 second trial and the time that the mouse spent with its nose within one centimetre engaged in sniffing was recorded during that 50 second trial. And this 50 second trial on the day of testing, uh, the mouse was first exposed to mineral oil three times to acclimate. And then it was exposed to the most diluted odor, less dilute and then least diluted odor. So the odor concentration progressively increased as the test progressed. So this showed uh, in the PBS group, so the control group that received phosphate buffered saline, PBS, into the olfactory bulb. If we look at the mineral oil trials, we can see that mice spent the longest time investigating mineral oil trial one when they're first exposed to the mineral oil. And upon subsequent exposures, they spent less time investigating the mineral oil. And that significantly reduced um, at both mineral oil two and the third mineral oil trial compared to the initial trial, showing that the mice acclimatized to the test and had become habituated to the mineral oil odor. If we then compare the third mineral oil trial to the three odor dilutions, so this was propanoic acid uh, diluted to 10 to the negative six, 10 to the negative four, and 10 to the negative two. 
we can see that the mouse uh, engaged in a greater time uh, investigating this odour, suggesting that they were able to detect the odour and didn't have any olfactory impairments. And this was uh, apparent for all three odour dilutions tested at all three time points, so at the one, the three, and the six month time point in those PBS control mice. If we compare that to mice that had been injected with mouse preformed fibrils or PFFs, we can see that these mice were still able to habituate to the mineral oil with that reduced time spent by the third mineral oil trial. However, when we compare that mineral oil trial to the first or most diluted odor, we can see there was no significant increase in the time spent sniffing with the odor present at the one month time point, suggesting that there had been a minor deficit in the olfaction of these mice. When we then look at the three and the six month time point, we can see that these PFF injected mice now no longer respond to any of the three odour concentrations tested at both this three and that six month time point. And one thing to note here was that this test used 25 to 30 female mice per group. So while this style of testing has advantages such as being simple, it doesn't require any specialised apparatus or training of the mice, there are other factors that can impact the result, not purely just looking at olfaction. So some examples of factors that can also impact the outcome of this test is, sorry, um, their ability to move, which is impaired in Parkinson's disease models. So it's reliant on the animal being able to approach the uh, odor stimulus. Other things such as anxiety and depression uh, and how willing an animal is going to be to approach a novel object or novel um, stimulus. Other behavioral tests, uh, olfactory tests are food-based, so it depends on how motivated an individual animal is for that particular food. So food-seeking behavior can also impact the outcome. And finally, a researcher's interpretation of the animal's behavior and their reflexes in timing the time spent sniffing or engaged in the investigation of the odor can lead to issues in terms of reproducibility between the labs or even within the lab when there's different researchers performing the testing. So these different factors can lead to a variety or like a large variation between groups. So you often need many animals to be able to detect a difference between the two, uh, the two groups you're interested in looking at. Therefore, the aim of the study I'm going to be talking about today was to optimize a more objective olfactory test to use in our Parkinson's disease models. So to do this, we collaborated with Daniel Wesson at the University of Florida to create this semi-automated olfactory based system. So I'll try and run through this schematic for you in a clear way. So we have a custom made script that allows us in Synapse Lite to trigger the opening of a specific valve. Uh, so this valve is then in our program open for six seconds. And while it's open, it allows air to flow uh, through this flow meter. So the amount of airflow is regulated through the valve into the connected odor vial. Odor particles in the headspace of this valve can then flow through the connected tubing into the airflow to the mice in the testing chambers. So these testing chambers are airtight. So any change in uh, air pressure detected by these transducers that are connected is most likely due to the respiration of the animal. So as it's inhaling and exhaling. And then we get this recorded information is amplified and digitally filtered. And we can in real time see the waveforms of the respiration, inhalation, exhalations of the animal. And this information is also digitally stored along with the opening and closing of the valves for future analysis of the data. So the protocol we use with our new olfactory testing setup included three days of habituation prior to testing at all time points. 
So for this, the mice were put in the chamber for 30 minutes and exposed to mineral oil, which was the diluent, every minute. And this allowed the mice to acclimatise to being within the testing chamber, being handled, as well as uh, any noises associated with the valves opening and closing and any pressure changes in the chamber. On the actual day of testing, mice were exposed to mineral oil every minute for 11 trials. And then after those 11 trials, they're exposed to the odour dilution starting at 10 to the negative eight and progressively increasing in concentration to 10 to the negative two, again being exposed once per minute. Mice were tested for three consecutive days using three different odours. And these were all diluted to 2 tor to normalise their vapour pressure prior to that dilution series so that we could then pull results um, at the analysis stage of the study. So you may be wondering, is a one minute trial interval sufficient for all odour particles to be evacuated from these airtight chambers? Our collaborator Dan Wesson used a photoionisation detector to look at odour particles inside of the testing chamber. And you can see on the x-axis at zero seconds when the odour was turned on or the valve was opened, we see a steady increase in the amount of odour particles during that six seconds that the valve was opened. And then once the valve has been closed, this quite rapidly declines again. So at about 10 seconds after odour or valve being turned on, a majority, if not all of those odour particles have already been evacuated from the chamber. So this is an example of the type of respiration waveform we generate using this test. And you can see in this first example is a mouse that's responding to the odor. And the second example is of a mouse that's not responding to the odor. So we use their respiration to look at the instantaneous frequency of respiration. So normally a mouse who's in a basal state or baseline state will sniff four to five times per second. And previous literature has suggested that anything above six or six hertz is considered investigation type of sniffing. So an investigation uh, threshold was applied so that anything above six hertz we considered to be investigatory behavior. And you can see that during the baseline period, those first 10 seconds shown on this graph, um, the mice do occasionally or spontaneously uh, initiate this type of investigatory behavior due to a non-odor stimulus. And then the red bar here is showing when the odor was turned on, and we can see that the mouse now spends more time engaged in that investigatory sniffing upon detecting the odor. In this second example where the mouse was not responding, we can see there still are the occasional um, increases in investigatory sniffing, but that doesn't really differ from that baseline spontaneous uh, behavior. So the first thing we did before using this new olfactory testing approach in our Parkinson's model was to validate it using an established hyposmia model. So in our situation, we use zinc sulfate. So for the zinc sulfate model, we performed bilateral intranasal zinc sulfate injections. So we injected zinc sulfate into one nostril of the mouse while it was anaesthetized. And then we inverted the mouse and laid the mouse on the side so that any excess liquid could drain from the nostril as if it's ingested, it can cause systemic effects and may require the uh, mouse to be euthanized for welfare reasons. This is then repeated with the other nostril. Um, as this destroys the olfactory neurons in the olfactory epithelium, creating an acute or temporary hyposmic state. So this usually lasts one to two weeks um, for mice. So we allowed our mice to recover 48 hours before progressing to the olfactory testing. If we look at graph B here, we can see saline in black and zinc sulfate in gray. And these two groups uh, didn't significantly differ at pre-injection. So just based on the random allocation of mice to these two groups. But when we look at post-injection, we can see that the gray zinc sulfate group spent significantly less time engaged in this investigatory sniffing. 
If we break that down over the different odor dilutions, we can again see that the zinc sulfate group uh, consistently spent less time engaged in investigatory sniffing compared to that saline control group, indicating that these mice were hyposmic and that our testing approach was sufficiently sensitive to detect that hyposmic state in this model of hyposmia. Onto our PFF prodromal model. So for this data set, we perform bilateral PFF injections into the olfactory bulb of female mice. And then we used our new olfactory testing approach at one, three and six month post injection. And we also compared this to a manual style of testing the buried pellet test, which I'll describe more later at the three and the six month time point. So we looked at phosphorylated serine 129-alpha-synuclein as a marker of pathological alpha-synuclein in olfactory structures, such as the anterior olfactory nucleus and the piriform cortex. Uh, these are both secondary olfactory structures and both had extensive accumulation of phosphorylated alpha-synuclein at this six month time point. And we can see, uh, well, we can't, the anterior olfactory nucleus is one synapse away from that injection site, the olfactory bulb, and the piriform cortex is one to two synapses away from the olfactory bulb. When we look at the substantia Niagara, we can see there's no pathology at this six month time point, which was as we expected. So moving on to the olfactory test data, we first looked at habituation to the mineral oil. So we can see PBS in black and PFF group in gray, and that both groups were able to engage in investigatory sniffing, so above that six hertz threshold, when they were first exposed to mineral oil on the beginning of the testing paradigm that I talked about earlier. As the mice are continued to, continue to be exposed to the mineral oil over repeated trials, this falls, or their response falls below that investigation threshold suggesting that they're acclimated to the testing setup. And we can extrapolate that any change above that six hertz threshold later in the testing is due to the presence of the odor being uh, exposed to the animals. And we can see this consistently for both groups at all three time points. So at one month, three month and six months. Again, this is example of the respiration traces that we obtain using this style of testing. The top panel is from examples from PBS treated mice and the bottom examples are from PFF mice. Uh, again, we can see their respiration channel and then looking at insta instantaneous frequency, we can see that when the odor was on with the red bar here, that the mice in the PBS group engaged in more time, uh, engaged in this type of investigatory sniffing compared to their baseline and compared to mice that were injected with the PFFs. We can also see this graphically. So if we compare the overall time spent engaged in investigatory sniffing at the three time points, we can see the PFF group in gray spent significantly less time at the one, the three, and the six month time point. When we compare this to the buried pellet test, so briefly for this test, mice are fasted overnight, and then either a pellet or a treat in our hands, we used Captain Crunch, a sugar sweetened cereal. So this was hidden half a centimeter under the bedding in a clean cage, and the time taken for the mouse to uncover this treat was recorded. And this was performed over three days and the average time taken was then generated and that's what's plotted on the graphs here. So we can see the, say, uh, the PBS group in black and the PFF group in gray. There is a trend that the PFF group does have a longer latency to uncover this treat. However, this isn't statistically significant at the three month or the six month time point. So to summarize, our semi-automated system appears to be more sensitive and therefore capable of detecting smaller changes in olfactory perception that may be going undetected using those manual styles of testing. One thing to note here is we only had five to six female mice per group to detect these differences. 
So um, that's a lot fewer mice than those manual tests often require due to the greater variability in the results generated. The deficit we're seeing in investigatory sniffing of the pre-FF treated female mice seems likely to due to an olfactory sensory deficit rather than a deficit in the motor act of sniffing itself. As we could see on that first mineral oil trial that the mice in the PFF group were capable of engaging in sniffing above that six steps threshold. And we also saw no pathology in the substantia nigra or obvious signs of motor impairment, which could impede the motor act of sniffing. So our new methodology could be used in future Parkinson's disease models to help facilitate the development and evaluation of potential therapeutic interventions that are specifically aimed to prevent olfactory deficits and looking at the spread of alpha pathology, as well as the sequential neuronal dysfunction and loss. If this is a topic that you're interested in reading more about, our preprint is available via, via archives. And we have submitted the proof for the final version of this manuscript to scientific reports today. So hopefully this will soon be available as the final version of the manuscript as well. With that, I just want to thank everybody for listening today and thank 3P for giving me the opportunity to present to you all. I'd also like to thank the P. Brunden Lab, specifically Gabby, Lindsay, Lisa and Luke who are involved in this project. Our collaborator, Dan Wesson at the University of Florida and the Van Andel Biostats Corps. I'm happy to take any questions now, or if you have any questions later, feel free to contact me on Twitter. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mickey, for that presentation. So we're going to move into the Q&A portion. Again, a reminder, if you want to submit any questions, you have that option at the bottom of your screen. So Mickey. I was going to start asking you, how do you think that the alpha synuclein deposits are causing these deficits? It's a good question. Um, I think it's possible that cells that accumulate these alpha synuclein deposits, this could be disrupting the signaling within those cells. And I think our second speaker today, Ash, will be able to go into this in more detail with her results. So, She's been looking at the PFF model in mice as well and looking at the neuronal activity. So I think she might be able to shed some more light on the underlying mechanisms that may be causing these deficits that we're seeing. Okay, so we have a question that kind of tags onto this from an anonymous attendee. Do the olfactory deficits correlate with the alpha synuclein pathology load? We did see this to some extent in our results, although we only had five to six mice per group. So it's not really sufficient to really power that kind of correlation analysis. Um, it was quite promising, but again, you'd need a bigger cohort of animals to be able to say definitively whether that does directly correlate. It is something we think that would be worth pursuing, um, injecting like a serial dilution of PFFs in animals and correlating that pathology load to the deficits to see how the relationship really is between the two. Yeah, sure. Uh, Priyadharshini is asking, have you performed these experiments with other forms of the protein? So monomers, oligomers, I'm assuming. The previous work by Nolan Ray, who first established this prodromal Parkinson's disease model, included uh, the PBS control, a non-injected control, and a monomers control, and saw no difference between those three kind of control groups um, in terms of developing, like none of these developed any alpha-synuclein pathology or developed the deficits that she was seeing. So um, we've now in the future just used the PBS, at least for this study, as the control group. Yeah. Um, so we have a question from an anonymous attendee. The biggest risk factor for PD is old age. Are these mice considered aged? And also follow up from that. Do you think a longer time point would lead to more or less pronounced olfactory deficits? So at the longest time point, the six month post injection, the mice are nine months of age, which is considered kind of getting towards like middle aged in a mouse. So still not quite to that age equivalent of humans. Um, I think 
like mice also experience age dependent declines in things such as olfaction. So looking at an older cohort could definitely be interesting. We just haven't performed that ourselves. I know Nolan performed later time points with her testing. She also looked at 12 month post injection. So if you look at that paper, that also looks at that older cohort of mice. Yeah, and also if the uh, control mice would experience age dec decline based on age, it might be more difficult to see the differences between the groups, if that's also going to influence the controls. If it's only a subtle difference, it might be harder to detect any change if the yeah, control baseline that you're comparing it to is also reduced at that point. Yeah. So Sandra is asking, is it known whether olfactory bulb is one of the first regions affected by alpha-synuclein pathology in PD? So according to BRAC staging based on post-mortem Parkinson's disease uh, patients' brains, they do show that as well as the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, the olfactory bulb and the anterior olfactory nucleus is postulated to be one of the first regions that develops alpha-synuclein pathology. So um, as well as those early onset hyposmia features that they see in people with Parkinson's disease, it does seem that it's also a region that's affected early in the disease in terms of the pathology developing. So any other uh, PD models where we have uh, olfactory deficits, do you know that? So that, that might not be PFF based models? Yeah, so other models such as MPTP or 6-hydroxy dopamine have also been used as well as uh, genetic models of Parkinson's have shown olfactory deficits. Um, one drawback or positive, depending how you're looking at it with the genetic models, is they have a very long, usually, time point, so are more time consuming to run. And genetics, like the genetic form of Parkinson's disease, is also only accounting for about 10 or 5 to 10 percent of the PD population, with majority of people having idiopathic disease. And I guess the drawback with the MPTP and the 6 hydroxy, while they have many other benefits, they don't usually cause an uh, accumulation or extensive accumulation of alpha-synuclein. So this, if you're wanting to look specifically at alpha-synuclein's role in the development of these deficits and whether it's actually involved in the mechanism or if it's something completely different, then I think the PFF model is a good way to assess this. Yeah. An anonymous attendee is asking, do you have any clue why there's no pathology in the substantial migra? I think it's just too soon. So this is the same as what we saw with Nolan's study that at that six month time point, it just hasn't been long enough. I think the substantia nigra is a minimum of two to three synapses away from the injection site. So it just requires a longer time point for pathology to be able to move from the site of injection all the way to the substantia nigra. Yeah. Uh, Priyad Harshini, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name now, uh, is asking, do you think this pheno phenotype differs between different strains of mice? Quite possibly, yeah. <laughs> so we use C57 black 6N mice in our study, um, but I think my strains in general, when you're using them for modeling there's like using different strains, using the same model, you can often quite see quite different results. I know Walter Pilatz, who's presented uh, in the first 3P session, has seen differences in mice strain when he's been looking at um, inducing UTIs in mice and the inflammation and the response to a UTI, and that's very different depending on the mice strain. So I think um, it could definitely be different depending on the mice strain you use. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we're at the end of this Q&A. And thank you so much, Mickey, for your presentation and for answering all of these questions. No worries. So we're gonna thank you. <laughs> we're going to move on to our second speaker, which is Ashivarya Kulkarni, or Ash, uh, who's a PhD student at University of Florida. And she will be presenting her research on alpha-synuclein perturbs in vivo neuro neural activity following seeding in the olfactory bulb. So I'm going to hand it over to you now, Ash. Thanks, Lisa. So 
So I'm just going to start off by stopping my video and I can share my presentation. Okay. So to start off, I want to thank everyone who's involved in the 3P seminar series. It's been a great opportunity to learn some really new things every week. So that's, that's one thing that I'm looking forward to every week. Um, so today I'm going to show you evidence that alpha-synuclein perturbs in vivo neural activity following seeding in the olfactory bulb. And I am a second year graduate student in Dan Wesson's lab in University of Florida. So to start off, I'm going to first talk about disease progression. So if you consider the life of an individual who's destined to develop PD, it is known that the molecular disease process, particularly Lewy body aggregation in this case, forms way, starts way before the patient is diagnosed. So this time period between the initiation of the molecular disease process to the point of patient diagnosis is called as a prodromal phase of the disease. And this prodromal phase is characterized by very subtle non-motor deficit out of which we are really interested in the olfactory perceptual deficits that are associated with the PD prodrome. So our studies and previous other studies that Mickey talked about have shown that alpha-synuclein in the olfactory system induces olfactory deficits. In addition, the BRAC staging has also shown uh, and indicated that the Lewy body aggregation first occurs in the olfactory bulb in the early stages of PD pathogenesis, and that's how it spreads downstream in the late stages of PD pathogenesis, ultimately reaching the motor cortex where the classic motor deficits of PD are observed. So now that I've spoken about Lewy bodies, we all know that these Lewy bodies are made up of a misfolded protein, alpha-synuclein, and under physiological conditions, this protein is present in two conformations one being the soluble monomeric conformation, which is in equilibrium with the multimeric membrane-bound conformation. And due to certain changes in the internal environment of the cell that are not completely known at the moment, it could result in the formation of pathological conformations of synuclein. Um, and some of them are protofibrils leading to the formation of amyloid fibrils leading ultimately leading to the formation of Lewy bodies. And for, our, for the sake of our experiments, we have been using preformed fibrils of alpha-synuclein, commonly referred to as PFF, and they are the pathogenic variants of these amyloid fibrils. So many previous studies have shown um, that addition of these PFFs into the brain is able to recapitulate PD pathology and also able to induce PD-like inclusions. So since this PFF seeding model has been extensively studied, I'm just gonna distill down some of the major findings, which are first, it recruits the endogenous alpha-synuclein to accumulate. Second, alpha-synuclein seeding triggers transneuronal transfer, meaning it spreads from the seeding site to other anatomically interconnected regions and this spread occurs in a spatiotemporal fashion. Third, if these aggregates are isolated, they are resistant to proteinase K and they also stain positive for Lewy pathology. Next, these aggregates are put primarily detected in neurons, but not in astrocytes, microglia, or oligodendrocytes. And if these are in the in vitro studies have shown that if these aggregates are um, cultured with cells, it results in a dose-dependent uh, change in the neural activity, and it also changes the level of certain synaptic proteins. So all of these effects that have already been, been demonstrated before could possibly explain the olfactory behavioral deficits that are seen in models where PFF is seeded in the olfactory bulb. However, one major gap in knowledge at the moment is what is the link or what is the mechanism that relates the olfactory alpha-synuclein aggregation with the olfactory perceptual deficits that are seen in the PD prodrome. This led us to ask the question, what are the effects of pathogenic alpha-synuclein assemblies 
on local neural activity in vivo. So for answering this question, we have been using an uh, have been using the olfactory system. And the whole idea behind it is that if we find any perturbations in olfactory neural activity, it is going to invariably impair the key olfactory functions that underlie it and also is going to result in olfactory perceptual deficits. So before I start talking about the experiment, I'm just going to go a little deep into neural dynamics and how can you measure them for people who might not be completely familiar with the concepts of in vivo physiology. So neural dynamics can be measured in different ways, so to say. Uh, first one being the scalp EEG recordings, wherein it's a, it's a fairly superficial recording in which the electrodes are placed on the scalp and local activity is recorded. Local field potentials, commonly referred to as LFPs, are intracranial EEG recordings in which the electrode is physically lowered into the brain and it allows us to record from the sites that we are truly interested in. And as you can see here, it allows us to uh, obtain a waveform with a better spatio-temporal resolution as compared to the EEG. And since these LFPs pick up aggregated neuronal activity, how does it relate to the activity to a single cell level? So this is an example of what uh, of a raster plot of single unit activity. So each dashed line that you can see here is the spiking activity and each horizontal line is the spiking activity of an individual neuron over a period of a second. So when you record from multiple single units, it's going to give rise to multi-unit activity. And when you record from multiple multi-units, it's going to give rise to local field potentials or LFPs. And this is what we've been using in our experiments. Uh, so we've been using LFPs to pick up aggregated local activity from the bulb and another cortical structure that is piriform cortex that I'll just talk about in a few minutes. So like I said, that local field potentials are pick up aggregated network activity from a region and there could be multiple sources that contribute to these LFPs. And any fluctuation in these LFPs gives rise to oscillations, which are divided into different spectral bands depending upon the frequencies at which they operate. So especially in the olfactory system, these oscillations are considered to have unique roles that they play. So this is an example of what a local field potential recording looks like. So on the top is the full band activity that operates between zero to 100 Hertz. Embedded within this full band is theta, beta and gamma band activity. Now, when we apply a spectral filter between of 0 0.1 to 10 Hertz to the full band, it's gonna give rise to theta band activity and when we give, when we apply a spectral filter of 15 to 34 Hertz, it's gonna give rise to beta spectral band and so on. So in the olfactory system, especially in the olfactory bulb, where we are trying to see the PFF, uh, these spectral bands have different sources and they play different roles. So this is an example of what the neural connectivity in the olfactory bulb looks like. So the theta spectral band originates when there's volleys of afferent input from the nasal epithelium into the olfactory bulb. And, these, and this theta band is closely coupled to respiration. The exact source of beta band is not known at the moment, especially in the olfactory bulb, but it is thought to be involved in long distance communication between distant structures. So in this case, between the olfactory bulb and the preform cortex, which is an olfactory cortical structure that is involved in odor information processing. So in short, beta band is responsible for communication of odor information between the bulb and the piriform cortex that, that allows you to have an odor percept. Gamma band is orig uh, originates in the olfactory bulb from the dendrodendritic synapses, and it is reflective of local interactions within a structure, so local interaction within the olfactory bulb or local interaction within the piriform cortex itself. So the hypothesis of our experiment was accumulation of pathogenic alpha synuclein 
in the olfactory system leads to aberrant LFP activity. And in order to test this hypothesis, we had two key questions. One of which was, does alpha-synuclein aggregation influence spontaneous and odor evoked LFP activity? So since we are trying to measure if alpha-synuclein is affecting olfactory odor activity, we need to have certain olfactory specific tasks to answer this question. Second, is there any correlation, if there is any, between the pathological burden and the LFP dynamics? So in our experiments, we microinjected unilaterally uh, female animals with either PBS or PFFs in the olfactory bulb. And these animals were two to three months of age at the time of injection. Further, we allowed the animals to age for either one, two, or three months post-injection, and then implanted them with chronic electrodes in the olfactory bulb and the piriform cortex of the same animal that was ipsilateral to the injection site. Further, we let the animals recover, and then we recorded olfactory bulb and piriform LFP activity. And it was an awake head fix mouse setup in which the olfactometer was placed close to the snout of the animal. And this olfactometer was especially designed to give us a better temporal control over the amount of odor molecules that are presented to the animal during a recording session. So for recordings, we recorded an epoch of spontaneous activity, here at the bottom, followed by an epoch of odor-evoked activity, and again an epoch of spontaneous activity. And during the odor evoked activity, the animals were exposed to different odors. And these odors were presented to the animal in a pseudo random order. And this, the, and each odor was presented to the animal for a period of four seconds. And finally, we stained for P serine 129, which is a marker for pathological or misfolded alpha synuclein. And similar to the results that Mickey talked about, we found that in spite of seeding in the olfactory bulb, we found that the preform cortex had significantly higher pathological accumulation compared to the olfactory bulb. So since she's already talked about it, I'm not going to go too deep into it. So jumping right in, we recorded spontaneous LFP activity from the animals that were injected with PBS and PFF. So this is a representative trace of what LFP recording looks like under spontaneous dynamics. So on the top is the respiratory theta in the olfactory bulb, followed by full band activity in the olfactory bulb and the piriform cortex. And when we applied filters, we obtained the beta and gamma band activity in the olfactory bulb and the piriform cortex. And the gray dashed, vertical dashed lines that you can see here are representative or are visual indicators that are trying to show you that all of the oscillations are closely coupled or in phase with the respiratory theta and the olfactory bulb at the top. So on analyzing spontaneous LFP activity, we found that in spite of seeding in the olfactory bulb, there was aberrant LFP dynamics in the preform cortex of the animals, which was really interesting. So just to kind of lay out the graph, here you can see is the response of spontaneous activity in the three spectral bands, that is theta, beta, gamma, on the top, that is organized into different brain regions, that is olfactory bulb and the piriform cortex as rows. And each circle that you can see is data from an individual animal that is injected with either PBS or PFF, denoted by clear circles and filled in circles. So, and it is also organized as months post injection on your y axis. So, again, to draw your attention to the preform cortex, we found that there was an elevated or significant increase in beta and gamma band in the preform cortex. And this change or this treatment effect was seen at two months post seeding in PFF injected animals. So, this indicates that the pathological accumulation has not only affected the LFP dynamics in a regionally selective manner, but also has resulted 
in a transient change that and in spite of and we see this transient change that is in spite of seeing a progressive increase in the pathological accumulation in the pcx which was really interesting further we recorded odor revoked activity so a unique feature of the olfactory system is that it helps us or it allows us to record sensory evoked activity at the primary and secondary nodes in the olfactory processing while the animal is actively trying to um, sample the information so it's going to allow us to check exactly at which point meaning if it if it impairs the lfp activity in the olfactory bulb or if it impairs the lfp activity in the piriform cortex so in this case we recorded odor revoked activity in the pbs and pff injected animals and this is what a representative trace of the recording looks like so again on the top is the respiratory theta followed by full band in the olfactory bulb and piriform cortex and then when we applied a filter we obtained beta band in the bulb and the piriform cortex and finally what you can see here is the rms amplitude at the bottom which reflects the beta amplitude in the olfactory bulb so hopefully you can appreciate here how the amplitude of the beta spectral band in the olfactory bulb changes when the, when the animal was presented with the odor so in this case isopentyl acetate is the odor that was presented to the animal and the highlighted pink portion is um it denotes the time that the odor was presented so on analyzing odor evoked activity we found that in that we seeded in the olfactory bulb and we found aberrant lfp dynamics in the olfactory bulb so to just kind of again lay out the graph it's laid out in the exact same fashion as the previous one where there's responses in different spectral bands on the top and it's organized uh, according to brain regions as rows and what we found here was that it was uh, was completely different from the spontaneous dynamics so unlike spontaneous dynamics where there was an aberrant lfp activity in the piriform cortex here we found an aberrant or increase in beta band activity in the olfactory bulb and again unlike the spontaneous dynamics where the change was transient at 2 months of age here it is seen across all age groups and it was very consistent so again one thing that is worth pointing out here is this one possible outlier at the top so when we excluded this animal from the analysis the treatment effect of pff was still sustained and another thing worth pointing out that's why it's actually highlighted in black is that th this animal had an abnormally high accumulation of p serine 129 in the olfactory bulb itself so these results in all tell you that pathological accumulation has not only affected olfactory information processing but it also has done it in the olfactory bulb which is the first or the initial processing stage in the olfactory processing cascade next we ask the question are these changes in the aberrant lfp dynamics that we can see correlated to the p serine 129 burden so to just kind of remind you to your left is uh, we saw changes in the beta and gamma spectral band wherein there was an enhanced beta and gamma band activity in the piriform um, in the pff injected animals and when i tested for correlation analysis between the aberrant lfp dynamics and the pathological accumulation i did not find any correlation similarly on uh, to kind of remind you panel b is where we found an aberrant increase in beta band activity in the olfactory bulb during odor evoked dynamics and when i tested for correlation between the aberrant lfp dynamics and the pathological accumulation i did not find any so just to summarize alpha synuclein entails aberrant increases in network activity in vivo this network dysfunction is highly dynamic with region specificity and in some cases it also transiently occurs relative to the number of months that had elapsed after the injection 
and lastly this pathology in the olfactory system impacts the in vivo neural activity in a manner that is not directly correlated to the pathological burden so finally i would like to thank everyone in the vessen lab especially dan who has been an amazing mentor and he's been extremely supportive of me and our collaborators dr patrick brandon who's been an excellent collaborator and his contribution has definitely helped move this project forward and many members of the brandon lab who've been very kind and helpful and finally i would also like to thank dr kelvin luke for providing us with the fibrils because of which this project was possible and a preprint version of this manuscript is available via bio archives and if you have any questions you can contact me and we are also looking for postdoc position uh, postdoc and we have positions available in our lab so if you are interested in spending your summers and winters in florida you can contact dan who would be very happy to chat with you thank you thank you so much ash for that very interesting presentation so we're going to move to the q and a portion uh, and i thought i was just start, going to start off the q and a with asking you how you think these studies apply in humans yeah so that's an interesting question because everything needs to be applicable in humans um so lfps cannot be detected or well lfps can be detected but it cannot be used in humans because there's only one study at present that has recorded lfp activity from the bulb uh, intra dur during intracranial injections and it's done only in um, medically resistant epileptic patients so lfp so that's not a question uh, so we cannot really measure lfp dynamics in humans the other way to do is eeg but there's another major problem with eeg which is it cannot delineate the olfactory bulb signal with the cortical signal so there there was another paper that was published in 2020 from dr lundstrom and dr dan, uh, don wilson's lab um, that developed an electrobulbogram which is which is basically a modification of an eeg if i can say that and in that technique the electrodes are placed on the nasal bridge and it helps pick up the signals from the olfactory bulb exclusively so that technique can definitely be used in humans to detect aberrant lfp activity in prodromal pd oh i have never heard, never heard about that that's really interesting so we got a question here from punam uh, what is the speculated mechanism by which altered in vivo activity gets restored at 3 months post injection yeah we we don't know why that happens there is a transient change at 2 months um i can guess my best guess would be at 2 months of age maybe there is aberrant cell excitability or there could be just reversible changes in the synaptic or dendritic structure of the spines or there could just be aberrant synaptic functions that we don't know at the moment that get reversed at 3 months of age yeah so uh do you think you could comment on why you see this difference in results for the spontaneous versus the odor evoked responses yeah that's that's a great question and there are many interpretations to it and it all involves a lot of variables including the structure in which we are seeing these changes and the spectral bands that are incorporated um in this dynamic that changes depending upon whether the odor was given or not so if we are talking about spontaneous activity that is seen in the olfactory uh, in the piriform cortex uh, we saw changes in beta and gamma band activity so if so our whole theory is that this alpha synuclein accumulation is contributing in some indirect way to lead to local network activity dysfunction so there are two papers that got that were released in 2020 and 2019 from dr virginia lee's lab and dr brandon was also on one of the papers that uh, used the mathematical models to show that synuclein is uh, transporting is getting transported along the axons into the piriform cortex so in for as far as spontaneous dynamics in the piriform cortex is concerned beta activity is originates in the piriform cortex so there's definitely something going on in the piriform cortex 
and gamma band activity is also reflective of local interactions in the piriform cortex so there's definitely something going on again in the piriform cortex which is making it very vulnerable as far as odor evoked dynamics is concerned we saw significant changes in the beta band activity in the olfactory bulb so that gets a little tricky because it's known that the olfactory that the olfactory bulb requires the participation of the piriform cortex in order to generate the beta band activity and there's also lateral inhibition that comes in from the piriform cortex that modulates this beta band activity in the olfactory bulb so there could be certain changes that are occurring in the piriform cortex that are manifesting its effects in the olfactory bulb so there's definitely some concept of regional vulnerability that is coming into play in here yeah great answer thank you sandra says great talk could you speculate correlate electrophysiological abnormal abnormalities with any molecular changes like in calcium potassium sodium sodium channels yeah that's that's an interesting question and that's what we are probably trying to dwell into right now and looking into the more the mechanistic aspects of the changes that we are seeing and why we are seeing those changes or yeah. the lack of correlation that we are seeing no, that's a very specific. interesting project kriyad harshini says do you try correlating these results with order memory consolidation yeah so for our uh, test we did not do any um, it wasn't a memory based behavioral paradigm if i have to put it clearly so it would definitely be an interesting thing to look at if this pal if, if this alpha cellulin aggregation impairs odor retention which it has shown so maybe we could do some tests that incorporates the neural dynamics into the mix and a question from an anonymous attendee saying there was non neuronal synuclein pathologies found in the ob of human cases do you think that the change you observed was also part of the non neuronal cell response yeah that's that's an interesting question i'm not quite sure uh if that would contribute but that's definitely something that we would be interested in looking at um in the near future okay well thank you so much ash for answering all of this question and for a very great presentation and before uh ending today's session i just want to let you guys know that may 28th we will have miguel who's a postdoc at the vanadel institute joining us and he will talk about huntington aggregates triggering an immune response and we'll also be joined by Thomas Karkari from the University of Gothenburg, who will talk about blood phosphorylated tau as an Alzheimer's disease diagnostic marker. So again, thank you so much to our speakers and thank you to all of our attendees and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye, thank you.